Orange. Here you ah, go. Okay, there I am. All right, on Zoom again. Thought we were done with this, at least for a little while. But I am so glad we have, you can't hear me, okay? I don't want to get too loud. Don't worry about it, okay. I didn't want to be shouting at the people behind me. So if I am a little bit too, move up. We've got plenty of chairs here in the front. <laughs> Uh, so I want to welcome everybody, uh, our people who come back to see us here in uh, our library situation, and the folks who are online. I understand we have like 40 some people with us online. Uh, this is all an experiment. This is the first time we have tried this to do a Zoom hybrid live presentation. So please forgive any technical glitches or if we're not quite in focus or we're not quite loud enough you know, let us know in the chat, you know, say something out in the audience, we'll adjust. So it's, it's going to be kind of an informal situation in that respect. Uh, but again, I wanted to welcome everybody here. And uh, I think I recognize nearly everybody who's sitting here. Do we have anybody new here besides our people who are going to be here next time? Okay, good. So, um, so everybody, I won't have to go through my normal speech, you know, of uh, who we are, what we do, and please sign in. Um, however, I do have a suggestion box at the back, which um, I, I will say, and people on Zoom as well, if you have suggestions in terms of what you would like to see us do more of, less of, in terms of programming, in terms of times, dates, you know, anything that will help us improve the way we deliver our programs to you, please feel free to either write it down and put it in the suggestion box or put it in the chat box. You know, and then, cause we're going to be recording this and we'll be keeping everything. And we do like to get feedback. So uh, again, my name is Faith Justice, I'm the chair. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, Loretta who's going to introduce our next program. The program is coming up in November. So Loretta, if you wanna come up and tell people, you know, and do you want this or not? No, you haven't. All right, right. you've got it all memorized. All right. Hi. Um, so you need to stand right here in front of this camera. I'm going to push you around. Oh, is this one? Yeah, okay. right there. Oh, here I am. Okay. So um, next we, uh, month, I do hope you'll all come. Uh, we have a program on writing fight scenes, which is a very special skill. And the title of the program is uh, Who We Are is how we fight, character and conflict, telling a story and developing characters through violent interaction. And I'd like to ask our guest speakers to stand. We have Teal James Glenn here and Carol Gassander. And where I am standing right now will uh, be where they will be doing some live demonstration as well as talk and there will be a slideshow as well. So that is Wednesday, November the 9th um, and uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Thank you, Faith. All righty, everybody. It's so nice to see you all here. I'm actually going to travel with you. You can actually see our lovely room. And I'm going to come over here to this table where I'm going to sit with one of our three novelists that we have here today. Chris, you wanna come on up and sit where I'm sitting for a second? Well, we're all gonna start this together. So here we go. I love being part of this grand experiment. <laughs> here we go. So this is Chris Walter. She wrote Unnatural Creatures. She's one of our three novelists that's going to be presenting tonight. First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Chris. She's amazing. Yes, she launched her book just yesterday, and now we get to share her tonight. Chris writes books that explore the hidden stories of women's lives. Her latest novel is Unnatural Creatures and was named an editor's choice by the Historical Novels Review, who praised it as worthy of comparison to Jean Rye's Wide Saragosso Sea, a splendid achievement from a writer at the height of her powers. Her debut novel, The Lost History of Dreams, received a starred Kirkus review and was named a Crime Reads Best Book of the Year. Chris Walter's nonfiction books include The Book of Goddesses, Bad Princess, 
and doomed queens. There's a theme going on here. <laughs> she is also the creator of the Goddess Tarot, it, which is one of my favorite tarot decks, by the way, which has over a quarter of a million copies in print. Chris lives and works in Brooklyn. So now we're gonna talk about her book. Unnatural Creatures reimagines Mary Shelley's Gothic masterpiece through the eyes of three women closest to Victor Frankenstein and his monster, his mother, wait, uh, Victor Frankenstein and his monster. The three women are his mother, Caroline, his bride, Elizabeth, and the servant, Justine. Chris will now read a brief section from her book. Well, first off, I'm so thrilled and honored to be here. I mean, the Historical Novel Society, when I first began writing fiction, I met Faith and Faith invited me to join. And through this, I've made so many friends and so many, you know, met so many amazingly talented authors. So thank you for having me here in support of my book. Um, this is Unnatural Creatures. I'm gonna read from the hardcover. And I'm reading a brief passage, which features the first appearance of the monster. Um, the setup is that Caroline, Victor's mother, is involved, they're having like a fetch on, in a park before he leaves for Eng Ingolstadt to study what they believe math, not going to be mathematics, but instead he will be doing something a little darker than that. So she's very pleased with herself. And so she has like a glass of wine too much and she kind of begins to fall asleep. The sun grew brighter, the air warmer. Caroline's eyelids flagged, she dozed. But instead of dreaming of her father, as she sometimes did, she dreamt she was in Ingolstadt and Victor's rooms, which were different than Alphonse's description. A winding wood staircase, a gallery leading to an attic chamber, dormer windows overlooking the university entrance, the town square, a skylight. In her dream, Caroline took in everything with pride, her son, a scholar, away from his family, grown. Somehow she was pregnant again. How satisfied she felt. In the attic, Victor had already set up his books on a long table, a long board with sums. Or were they drawing? She couldn't tell. You're here, Victor said, approaching her. Yet he wasn't the Victor she knew, it was an older Victor, a Victor who appeared exhausted, pale, emaciated. For some reason, he reminded of her father after their ruin. The curse he'd embodied, he'd asked, what do you think of my work, mother? What work? She clutched her belly, the baby kicked. Over here. He raised his hand, pointing. Carolyn followed the line of his finger toward a corner of the attic where a long shadow fell across the wood floor. Someone tall, silent, the scent of rotting leaves, death. Who could it be? Whoever he was, he approached Caroline, the yellowish gleam of his teeth shifting in a strange grimace. Caroline felt her blood rush, the blood within her womb. Mm. <laughs> hey, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I'm going to unmute our Lydia. Let me find her real quick here. Yes. Uh, yes, I can do that. There we go. All right, Hi. Lydia, you can hear us? Yeah, I can hear you great. Yes, all right, everybody. I'm so excited to introduce you to Lydia Kang. Lydia is a practicing physician and she's an author of the adult historical mysteries, The Half-Life of Ruby Felding, A Beautiful Poison, The Impossible Girl, and the book we're talking about tonight, Opium and Absinthe. She has also written young adult novels, Control, Catalyst, Toxic, and The November Girl. Along with Nate Peterson, she has written the nonfiction book, Quackery, a brief history of the worst ways to cure everything, and Patient Zero, a curious history of the world's worst diseases, also with Nate Peterson. She contributes to the Washington Post byline in the new well and being section called Ask a Doctor. And she has a forthcoming book with the Star Wars franchise entitled Cataclysm, arriving in 2023. 
Yes, not only a doctor, she has to be a prolific writer. It's amazing. Lydia Kang's Opium and Absinthe is set in 1899 in New York City, where a murder, a mi murder mystery is coinciding with the publication of Bram Stoker's new novel, Dracula. When the lifeless body of Tilly's sister is discovered in Central Park, Tilly's imagination leaps to the impossible. The murderer is a vampire. And now Lydia, Lydia is going to read a section from her book. All right, thank you guys so much for having me here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be reading from Opium and Absinthe. Um, this is pretty early on in the book when our heroine Tilly is trying to figure out exactly who or what has killed her sister. Um, her sister was found, you know, with puncture wounds in her neck and blood drained of her body. So she's reading Bram Stoker's Dracula and trying to figure out exactly if vampires exist. So that's where we start. Tilly opened her mouth wide and inspected her teeth. Her sharp canine seemed pitifully small and unanimal-like. How could a person bite someone with these? How could a vampire grow such teeth? The newspaper said no blood had been found at the scene, which meant even Lucy's lilac dress must have been spotless. How? Tilly reached awkwardly across the bed, grabbed her small notebook and scribbled on a new page. No blood at scene. How to drink blood without making a mess. She put the notebook down and went back to her mirror. With her free hand, she yanked at the side of her mouth to gain a better view of her right canine. Definitely not sharp enough, she said, saliva pooling under her tongue. Though with her fingers in her mouth, it sounded like definitely not far enough. The door swung open suddenly and her mother entered the room. Tilly's eyes opened wide and she quickly pulled the fingers away, a rope of saliva linking her fingertip to her lip. Matilda, what are you doing? Her mother asked. All right, that's my little oh. bit. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Now I'm going to find Lisa, our next panelist here, asked to unmute. Hi, Lisa. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. All right. Our third, our third panelist, Lisa, writes fiction inspired by the Middle Ages in Europe. She is the author of a six-part series, Sultana, where rivalries and ambitions threaten the last Muslim dynasty to rule more Spain. The first title in the series is available in multiple languages. Lisa was born in Barbados. She has lived abroad for 33 years until a recent permanent return to her island home. She is presented at the Historical Novel Society's 2015 conference and serves as the social media promotions manager for our New York City Historical Novel Society uh, chapter. And she's been a co-chair from 2015 to 2017. Now Lisa's works in addition to the Sultana also include short story contributions to the collaborative anthologies, Her Story, We All Fall Down, as well as On Falcon's Wings and The Burning Candle, all set in the medieval period. The book we're discussing tonight is Order of the Dragon and is the first novel in Lisa's newest series set in 15th century Romania and chronicles the turbulent lives of the father and brothers of the real Prince Dracula. Now Lisa will read us an excerpt from her book. Hi everyone, I am going to show you the Kindle only cover of my novel, Order of Dragon. The section that I'm going to be reading from, from tonight, it starts quite late into the book. Um, this is where Vlad, my central character, has a meeting with his cousin about events that are taking place in another land. Anatolia, which is currently ruled by the Turks in this time. When Vlad begins this conversation, it's on a very adversarial note because his cousin is one of the proponents, supporters of another ruler at the time. So you'll hear a bit of adversarial uh, tone in this conversation. And it begins, stunned. Vlad shook his head at his brother's folly and the sacrifice his cousin had made. When would their foes ever stop tearing apart Christian nations and families? My boy excels in Anatole, so his teacher has permitted an indulgence. The boy writes to me each Easter and before winter. 
In his last letter, he shared more about a concern first raised a year ago, rumors of missing children around Turkish Anatolia. Why should the Turks offspring affect me? Vlad asked. The stories thrived for more than a decade, his cousin answered, older than my son. Something stalks the streets of Turkish Bursa, a revenant dressed in all white furs. The fair has long red hair. The Turkic people say it steals babies. They are never seen again. Healthy women grown great with child die before they can give birth. They have puncture marks on their bodies. The blood drained away. You know similar night similar stories of night creatures in our land. Vlad whispered, you don't think he dared not finish the sentence. And then the haunting memories of Arena's long after her return to him. Find me, free me. Was this the unearthly meaning? A monstrous notion. Your sister died in Turkish Bursa. The palace servants buried her in Turkish tomb. They never summoned a Christian priest to give her last rites. I fear the worst, my Lord Prince. A red haze bloomed before Vlad's eyes. He shoved his cousin away. Fool, get away from me. Arena was a God-fearing woman. God would not let the evil one claim her to death. His cousin sighed. Did not the deceiver of men souls tempt even our Lord Jesus? That's my excerpt. <laughs> I'm so excited to share this uh, presentation with these wonderful writers, especially all along the theme of monsters. Um, I have so many questions about how they became interested, but first I'm gonna start with you, Chris. How did you first become interested in the story of Frankenstein and when did you decide that you could write this backstory to it? Well, I first read mm -hmm. Frankenstein when I was a child of 12. It was one of those situations where there was a scholastic book fair and I was, I like, I'm seeing people nodding very knowingly. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's like the entryway, right? <laughs> um, and I was obsessed with anything really scary and spooky. And I saw this small paperback, which I used all my allowance money to buy, thinking that, oh, this is gonna be good. Um, and it was, but not in the way I expected. I didn't realize that it was such a deeply philosophical novel. Uh, I jokingly say that Frankenstein is the ultimate book about bad parenting. But at that time, it was just a, a novel that it opened up all of these different ideas to me that I hadn't expected. And I didn't expect it to end the way it did. And it was just so different from the way pop culture brought it out. So that was my introduction to Frankenstein. And since then, I've read it every few years, I would say. And every time I go back, I find something new in it. And that's the genius of Mary Shelley. There's just so many layers. And when you consider that, it was written by an 18-year-old girl it's just astonishing. Um, so fast forward many years later, I'm not going to tell you how many years. Um, and I was always really fascinated with the three main characters of Caroline, Victor's mother, Elizabeth Lavenza, his fiance, who becomes his bride, and Justine, who has a very, very small role. Like she's basically described in a letter that Elizabeth writes to Victor, just kind of like, oh, you remember that that servant Justine that I love like a sister? Well, here's her whole backstory. <laughs> um, and I really, really just thought about, well, what were their lives like? What did they think when all of this was going on with Victor and the monster? We don't really know. And I brought up the idea to my agent and she said, I love this idea. I want you to do it. So I did, and here I am. Fantastic, <laughs> and we're glad you did. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Lydia, can you tell us about your interest with the story of Dracula and how you built your novel from that idea? Let's see, make sure you un oh, Yeah, I'm gonna unclick you here, sorry. Yep, you are there. Okay, okay. great, thanks. Um, can you, uh, what was your question again? 
when did you hit the button? <laughs> no worries. When did you first become interested in the Dracula story? Oh, so, um, well, I think that just as a kid, everybody sort of knows some of the superstitions surrounding vampires and surrounding Dracula. But I became really particularly interested in it after um, Bram Stoker's Dracula, the movie came out, the one with Winona Ryder in the 1990s. So I'm an X generation kid. So that came out right when I was like a teenager, young adult. And I, I thought it was just such an amazing movie. Like the character, they really humanized, you know, Dracula in a lot of different ways in that movie. But it was also just visually a stunning, stunning movie. And interestingly, there's a scene in that um, movie where they're drinking absinthe, but it's not actually in the book. But I've always associated absinthe with Dracula just because of that movie. So um, I ended up reading Dracula afterwards and really finding it actually very readable. Um, you know, I think sometimes you pick up um, books that were written 100, 200, 300 years ago and they are hard to get through because of the cultural and the language changes. Um, but it's not, it's, it's really fantastic reading. And so I came up with this idea of um, having a sort of, um, a murder mystery surrounding um, these deaths that look like vampires, but you just aren't sure if they're really there or not. So a lot of people, when they first pick up their book, they're like, is this fantasy or not? And I'm like, you have to read it to find out if it's fantasy or not. Um, but I had a fantastic time going over. I found this annotated version of Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is gorgeous. It has illustrations and wonderful notes and everything. Um, and uh, that helped me write the book. I found some fantastic quotes that I that I pulled for each chapter that was very useful for each chapter. And um, I managed to weave absinthe into the book because I just really wanted to. <laughs> um, but that's sort of where the, the idea kind of came from. I was sort of fascinating, fascinated with the idea of a time where people really questioned whether it could have been a, a thing or not. Fabulous. All right, let me get Lisa unmuted here. We'll ask her. Yeah, Lisa, are you there? Yes. Okay, so can you tell can us? You hear me? We sure can. Can you tell us when were you first thinking of doing this this epic background to the ancestors of of Dracula? I will tell you honestly, I was not thinking of it, but I put it in my mind was C. C. Humphreys. So C. Humphreys wrote what is arguably, I think, one of the best books on Vlad Dracula, my um, main character's son, in Vlad the Last Confession. I think that might have, I'm not sure exactly what year that came out, but I read that book and I was absolutely obsessed with it. It was an amazing portrayal of Vlad Dracula's life. So some of the notes that, um, that Chris had in the back of the book, I was just looking through them, thumbing through them, and there was one, um, there was also uh, some information on a website that led to an, a thesis on uh, Dracula and why he was so particularly violent. And there was one quote in that, which I have to read to you from this thesis. That is what set my story in motion. It said, early childhood data suggests Vlad Dracula may have suffered a certain degree of emotional neglect and may have somehow been shown a propensity from early on to enjoy violence. And I kept thinking to myself, who in the world raises their child <laughs> to have an appreciation of violence? So that's me off looking at the father's heritage and seeing what his life was like. And the father called Vlad Dracul was unfortunately her race in the society as violent as it could possibly be. It was in the middle of religious uh, upheaval between Catholics and the Hussites, another branch of Catholicism, but there was all this huge clash between the Turks and the Christians. And Vlad placed right in the center of that. His father fought against the Turks. He fought against the Turks. So I can't exactly blame Brad Dracula if he also grew up to be this monstrous figure. But where the 
where the vampire connection comes in with the story is that I understood that the Romanian people of the time, for them, this belief in vampires and ghosts and witches was as real as the things they could see outside of their windows on their streets every day. And I knew I could not write a straight historical about Vlad's father or his brothers. There would have to be these fa fantastical elements because that's what these people believed. Fabulous, thank you. So I'm gonna throw this question to you, Chris. At what point when you were writing this story from the women's point of view, did you have your opinion of the monster itself? Did it shift when you were writing this different perspective? Uh, no, because I've always been team monster, basically. <laughs> My friend Catherine, who's in the audience, she always says people who read Frankenstein are often end up team monster or team Victor, and I'm. No, 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 team monster or team. I'll play on both their houses. Oh, okay. A team on plague of both their houses. All right. Yeah. Well, I was more sympathetic to Victor the first time I read it. Uh, but no, I'm, I actually, the monster is one of my favorite characters. And I have to say that of all of the various layers and layers of research I did in terms of getting the women's voices to work, which was challenging because they're not very fleshed out in Shelley's novel, the monster was the easiest because he's so incredibly articulate. And I loved, I loved, loved, loved writing him. I just have a lot of compassion for him. It's also interesting how you got these three women to open up a different side of the monster that's yes. not necessarily in the, in the novel. Yes, I don't wanna spoil too much, but he has a special relationship with one of my, my three ladies. <laughs> and it's not what you would think. Um, it's not romantic. It's, it's actually, I think, very touching. But it's such a great point of view. It's really yes. fabulous. So Lydia, when you were researching, I mean, uh, did we lose the power? Robert, can you get back up there? Sorry? Okay, sorry about that. A glitch. Uh, Lydia, I was going to ask you, when you were, I mean, I think it was so fascinating that you set the possible victim of the vampire in Central Park. Um, in addition to having this whole uh, society that was also using drugs, using absinthe, using opium at the time, did you see this sort of connection with the drugs that were happening in the upper society and the, the terror of Dracula to be similar in a way? I think you have to unmute her. Every time, sorry, okay. Sorry, Lydia, here we go. There you yeah, are. sorry about that. I have two very small barky dogs, which is why I keep <laughs> putting myself on, on mute because I don't want them to ruin the but so far they're pretty quiet. But um, so I actually had done a good amount of research um, prior to this on my nonfiction book, Quackery, uh, which looked into a lot of um, medical history and some of these really kind of terrible ways that we used to treat each other. And I had written a big chapter on um, the history of opium usage in um, human civilization. And it was at that time that I found that um, a lot of uh, morphine um, users or people who were becoming addicted to morphine during the 1800s were wealthy women. And I found that to be an extremely interesting uh, factoid because apparently, um, you know, the syringes that they were using were, you know, they were hand blown glass and brass and these kits were expensive. And so only wealthy people could afford them. So I thought it would be kind of fascinating to explore what would be going on, um, you know, in the Gilded Age with a young woman becoming, um, you know, so dependent on injectable morphine. I was like kind of entranced with the idea of exploring that story and ex exploring how people dealt with addiction at that time, um, especially considering that women were meant to be put in their place. And when they didn't, they were called hysterical because their uterus was apparently behaving badly, that sort of thing. <laughs> so I, I thought that was a really fascinating idea. I also was interested in the Newsies, which were, um, you know, the, the Newsies strike had happened in 1899. Um, and, uh, so putting that together, I had also read about how, um, people who were victims of tuberculosis were sometimes thought to be, 
um, victims of vampires. So people thought that when you were wasting away from consumption, which is what we used to call people who had tuberculosis, um, it, it was like something was literally consuming them because they would get thinner and thinner and thinner until they died from the tuberculosis. And there was an active theory going on during the Gilded Age that vampires were sucking the life out of them. And so the time period just coincided with me thinking about this opium, opiate history with this tuberculosis story of vampires possibly existing, 1899 in the Newsies. And I was literally looking through a list of things that happened in 1899. And I found out that Bram Stoker's Dracula was released in the United States that that year. And that's when all the light bulbs, like that's when all those disparate things just went ding, 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 ding. And they all just like connected. And I was like, I have my story. So that's kind of how it started. It started with some research, not necessarily vampires and opium per se, um, but um, just multiple things coming together where all of a sudden my story just coalesced and said, this is, this is how it's going to be. I just thought it was such a great idea to have this sort of dread of being bitten by a vampire. So you have this horrible feeling also with this hyperdimeric needle that you're very mm -hmm which not wanting to have. I don't want to give away too many, much of the plot points because it's so brilliantly built about how these sensations got, but what, what a great idea that was. And Thank so um, Lydia, I wanted to ask you, as you're researching all the family for Vlad the Impaler, I mean, he was the descendant of the father that you're researching in this Order of the Dragon, is that right? Yes, he was. And so did you have a pretty firm idea about what you thought Dracula was and was it changed by the time you finished doing this research? Absolutely. I had grown up with the stories as has everyone else of Vlad Dracula, the son being this horrific, monstrous person. And then in researching his father, I came to understand where that came from. I now have the perception that Vlad, the father, Vlad, the son, were not any more particularly violent than anyone else of their time. There was a huge propaganda machine that came out of um, the, basically, Vlad's enemy, his prime enemy. That basically controlled what people would then begin to believe about Vlad Dracula later in life, including the idea that he was such a monstrous person that he could become an unearthly, undead blood drinker and never die. So there, there was definitely a huge propaganda machine that started in his father, Vlad Dracula's time, leading up to his time that defined him. But it's nice to come away from that now with a more balanced perception of a guy who was both guys who were quite ruthless but ruthless for a reason yeah. that's what I like to call it being ruthless with a reason so Chris I wanted to talk to you about how you have these three women who are being in an era where being assertive or having agency was just wasn't a given and yet each one of these women finds resources that they didn't know that they had at the beginning of your book. Did you chart this out with how things were unrolling in the Frankenstein novel at the same time? I, I did, and I had very, very long uh, Excel spreadsheets where everything was broken down. And it, it, Unnatural Creatures covers a period of 16 years, beginning with Caroline and her inter- introduction of Justine, the maid, into the household, and then ending at the turn of the century at the 1800. Um, and in between that, there was a lot of history going on that I'm convinced Mary Shelley was aware of. And I don't know if she consciously um, incorporated it, but it, it's there. Um, for example, I did not know that there were three revolutions in Geneva during that era. And also that um, there was one of these revolutions, um, they took 12 syndics who were kind of like the aristocracy ruling uh, rulers of, of Geneva as a city republic. And they executed 11 of them on the Plain Palais, which is the same place where Justine and another crime takes place. I don't 
want to give, I'm, I'm assuming most people are red flags, but in case you have, and I want to leave those pleasures to you to discover. Um, around the same time that Frankenstein takes place. So there's all these overlaps that just, once I saw that, I, it just like what Lydia was saying about ping, 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 things tying together, that's exactly what happened. Um, yeah, so it was, but just if you had seen this spreadsheet, you probably would have thought that, oh my goodness, the, the attention to detail, because it literally, it was about six feet long and went across the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. It was like I had all of these, you know, eight and a half by 11s taped together. And, you know, here's like Victor's line. Here's Riesling Ingolstadt. Henry, his best friend, he's over here. And then Justine is over there. And then meanwhile, what's going on in France with the revolution? Oh, the king and queen have lost their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like performance art. <laughs> yeah, except there was the only person who was watching, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> so Lydia, I wanted to ask you, you, Tilly is such a fascinating character in Opium and Absinthe. And she has such an amazing journey from being this young, girl to finding her own strength and power. Did you think that when you started the book that you would have issues of addiction associated with in that storyline? Yes, I, I kind of knew ahead of time that that was gonna be a part of the story. And I, I, and I wanted to, um, so as a physician, I, I've um, taken care of a lot of patients who dealt with addiction. So I feel like, um, and as a prescriber, it's, it's just sort of something that's in my world a lot. So I, I felt kind of comfortable tackling that, um, that, uh, that perspective. And I knew it would be um, kind of fascinating, but also awful at the same time to watch somebody descend into um, just breaking their, she has a broken bone that she, um, she breaks her collarbone in the first chapter. And from there she gets some pain medicine and it just sort of turns into, um, you know, this, this, it spirals into this addiction. And, and I knew that that would be something that the readers would be like, don't, don't stop doing that. Don't like, you know, when you, when they, they're making these choices, but I wanted people to see why she was making the choices. I wanted to see that she was a, a, a young woman in excruciating pain. She just lost her, her sister. She is being controlled, you know, by the forces around her. And, and it's, and it's so frustrating. And, you know, opiates were a, a way to try to make some things feel better, but they're also a method of control from outside forces in, in her case. Um, so yeah, it was, it's the opium, and the morphine are themselves a, a character in the story because they're there all the time. And, you know, everybody's reading this thinking like they know what the right thing to do is and Tilly, every time Tilly reaches for it, you're just sort of like, don't do that. Um, but I think it makes you sympathetic towards what she's going through and you can very easily see why um, addiction basically touches every, you know, section of society. It's because it's not just, you know, a certain type of person who, who can succumb to this. It's, it's, it's a universal thing and it's, it's really complicated. So I wanted to, I wanted to sort of tackle that. And I, you know, I hope I, I, I did it some justice. Yeah, it was beautifully ambiance because it was just as creepy as Dracula. I mean, you just felt this impending doom, would it escalate or not? And the mm -hmm. blood being tainted too is terrific. So Lisa, I wanted to talk to you about your love interest for Vlad or one of them. And I hope I'm going to say her name correctly. Is it Na Naya? Najna. Thank you. Um, she's so fascinating. Uh, how did you find out uh, that a woman at that time that she, uh, you know, she was so fully drawn and what she was interested in, and she was such a contrast to the other woman in the book. Did you have good resource materials to draw from for them? Absolutely not. <laughs> the, um, there is one thing that I must say, the medieval period does us as women a complete disservice. Unless we are the queens and princesses, we're often the ones in the background behind the men. But it was very important to me to show that Vlad Dracul's wife was a very important part um, of his life. And I should say first wife <laughs> is, uh, is what I'll say about that with completely ruining my story. But his, his first wife was an integral part of his life. She is also um, the woman who becomes mother of Vlad Dracula of, of Verifee. And 
I struggled a lot to come up with a lot of information about her because of, in particular, the name. The name Najna was not even her name. Her name was actually Vasilisa Maria, and she was from a section of Romania that at the time was independent called Moldavia. Um, it now exists today as the country Moldova. And she, this name that she comes up with is a very interesting story behind how she comes up with that name. It is apparently that someone came to court her and he did not remember her name when he was courting her. So he described her to a companion as someone's, as a prince's daughter. The word prince in their language at the time was niece. So apparently she took the feminine variation of that name as Najna for the name that she was associated with for the rest of her life. But other than her being Vlad Dracul's wife, the mother of three of his sons, there was absolutely no information about, the, about her. Who there was information about was Vlad's grandmother, who was a princess of Romania and later became uh, a, a huge uh, monastic foundation in society. His mother was Hungarian. So Nana is very much a composite of Vlad's grandmother and his mother. She is a woman who serves as the integral force of Vlad Dracul's life. He is absolutely devoted to her. And I think, I think uh, for everyone who has read for me so far this novel, they always say, you made her stand out so distinctly from Vlad's first lover. And I said, that's because I believe that this woman was the love of his life. His first wife was the love of his life. So I imbued her with all wonderful qualities. But as you saw from reading uh, her um, Susan, she's also no pushover, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is excellent. Chris, yeah. I wanted to ask you, were you at all intimidated on taking on Frankenstein? Hugely intimidating. I mean, it's Mary Shelley. It's one of the greatest novels ever written. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it started a whole genre of science fiction and horror and probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, gothic novels ever written. Um, it's funny because that's what, it, it is terrifying. Uh, but I just kind of had to hope that if the, since the idea came to me that I just did my best to be worthy of it. I spent a lot of time researching before I even began writing. I was very fortunate in that when I started working on the novel, it was uh, the 200 year anniversary of the first publication of Frankenstein 2018. So there were all these conferences and all these articles. And I have a wonderful librarian friend of Courtney Walsh, um, who whenever I'm researching my novel, she's, oh, any kind of novel. She helped a lot with Lost History of Dreams as well. She is able to get me what I call the good stuff. Um, so she found and unearthed all of these articles that I was looking for to just go deeper and deeper and deeper. And um, you know, all you can do is just prepare as much as you can and just try to be as receptive and humble and um, go for it. That's seamless. Yeah. I just really think it's amazing how you, I mean, it's like looking at a mirror and seeing the backstage crew set the next scene. <laughs> well, it was, I was reading, I read all of the different versions of, of Frankenstein. There's the 1816 manuscript, there's the 1818, which was the first publication. There's also the 1832 and the 1831, which was the one that Shelley, um, she re-edited it. Uh, and it was for like this special edition, which is where she wrote the famous introduction where she talks about having the dream of the scientist with his holy labor and the monster that inspired Frankenstein. Um, ultimately, I ended up drawing the most from the 1831 edition because Elizabeth Lavenza in that particular version is not a blood relation to Victor. Um, and she's an orphan, which really forwarded my theme about how Frankenstein is really a novel ultimately about bad parenting. There's all of these orphans. There's people being like Justine is abused by her mother and Caroline rescues her. Um, there's Caroline who, when the novel, when Victor opens the novel by describing his mother, he says that his father discovered her in basically this hut, nursing her 
father who had ruined them through unwise uh, speculation. And Geneva at the time was a city in which that if you had humiliated yourself in that way, basically you took off, like people didn't want to know you. So, you know, it's just like layers upon layers upon layers of bad parenting. And then we get to Victor, who creates this creature out of his hubris and his genius and immediately abandons him to do whatever. And it's, it's really like a tragedy of families falling apart. And I hope at least with Unnatural Creatures that I do have a final girl, as they say in the horror, <laughs> in the horror <laughs> business, that I've offered a little bit of healing and hope. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Lydia, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your uh, plot in which Nellie Bly and it sort of threads its way through. And Nellie Bly was such an amazing character here in New York City. Can you tell us how you first got interested and in how you figured out how to position her in your book? So um, because I knew that um, my main character, Tilly, was going to be interacting with a newsboy um, who's a you know young adult, he's in his like 20s, and, um, and she was going to become interested in using you know the newspaper um, the newspapers to sort of get some of her information, I immediately thought, well, I know Nell, I knew Nellie Bly was, you know, one of the most well-known first female journalists at the time. And so I started researching her and I found out that, um, cause I was wondering, it would be great if she was in her heyday and she could show up in the book, but it turns out she was past that at, by 1899, she had um, kind of retired from being um, a journalist. She had gotten married. It wasn't a perfect marriage. And she'd been in Europe for some time. And I think she'd come back after, I believe, the death of her sister. And um, so she was actually coming back in 1899 to Manhattan at the time that my story was going to take place. And so I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if she comes back and has a moment with my character, except that she's already been through her sort of journalistic um, career. And, you know, she's sort of, uh, you know, in mourning and, and has a lot of, been dealing with a lot of hurt on her own side. Um, and I thought it was, it would be kind of funny because Tilly herself is, a, is all about trying to glean more knowledge. She's intensely curious. It gets her in trouble all the time because she's super curious. And, um, and it would make sense that she might go to somebody that she thinks of as um, a, a leader in, in understanding and, and having information. So she's constantly writing to her throughout the book saying like, what would you do about this? And like, this is, I have like a problem here. And you know, Nellie's not even around, you know, so you sort of wonder where these letters are going to and if they're actually, you know, reaching her. And so I, I'll sort of leave that plot point out so that you can be surprised. But, um, but uh, I thought it would be very interesting to sort of weave her in and out. And she's not really in the story, but for Tilly, she is because Tilly thinks about her all the time. Tilly looks at her as somebody like, you've done what I would like to do, or I, could never do and um and you're amazing but so she it's it's kind of I think the version of like you know when you're a, a kid and you have a huge crush on a superstar and you're like writing them you know like letters because you're a big fan it's the same thing only it's in 1899 so I I, I thought that was kind of fun to to weave that in um but timing wise I very much stuck to the actual timeline of where Nellie Bly was in her life so I I show I you know, when we write historical fiction, I think there are some people who are extremely um, dedicated to sticking to the details. And there are other people who are like, I'm going to get most of it right, but I'm going to use my sort of fictional license to do whatever. And I, I have a lot of difficulty bending the rules with time periods and when people existed and that sort of thing. And so I oftentimes put historical figures into my books, but they only exist at that age, at that year where they would have been. And if they didn't exist, like if Nellie Bly had not been in the United States uh, in 1899, I, I wouldn't have put her physically in the book. So I, I kind of stuck to that because I, I am, those are some of the rules that I set for myself. I'm like, I can't, I can't cross those, <laughs> cross those lines. So. That's great. Thank you. And Lisa, with you, in terms of researching when Vlad was, you know, fighting the Turks and separated from his family, did you find that you had to really uh, stick to his development according to what really happened when he was being a killing machine or when he was being away at the king's uh, whims? 
Well, the thing about thing about Vlad's history is that one, it is so much, so much of it is actually wrapped in him. One, there is so much about the life of Vlad Dracula versus Vlad Dracula that the research at first was extraordinarily difficult. And then you add all of the vampire components. Thank you so much, Bram Stoker. Um, mm -hmm. It just, it made it actually quite difficult to find the civic details of where Vlad was at particular times. There is one instance um, that I cover in the book um, where he thought to, it's between the years of 1421 to 1424. There are two stories on him, one that he actually was in a Hungarian jail where his King Sigismund had placed him um, for running away and, and trying to get the Emperor Constantinople to help him take over his country of Romania. And then there's in the story that at that time he was, he was in Constantinople to the Emperor's bodyguards. So in that instance, I, I always make this very clear in my author's book. I go with what's the more popular theory. So the idea that he was um, with the emperor fighting rather than him in a jail languishing. Well, him in a jail languishing doesn't help my story. So I certainly wasn't going to go with that. But I, I think when you, are, when you are writing historical fiction, you have to just be very careful, as Lydia said where you, you try to, you try, I try to be on that side of sticking to the facts that are as close as possible. But I always indicate, you know, this happened, that happened. I don't know what really happened here, but I'm going with what was most likely historically plausible. And that's it. I leave it to the historians to crucify me if I'm wrong. <laughs> That's okay. that's what the author's note is for. <laughs> well, yes, thing, yes, exactly. <laughs> the thing that it was so wonderful about these three books, in addition to them being spine tingling and about monsters, was just the formatting that every chapter had a brilliant quote to kick it off. So, uh, Chris, I'm going to start with you. Um, some of the quotes that you had were, you know, I could tell they were right on the money with Frankenstein, and then others were sort of. Uh, reminiscent of a bigger picture of what was happening. Um, like this first one, I'm just going to read it. Um, the busy stage of life, the virtue of heroes, and the actions of men were his theme, and his hope and dream was to become one of them among those whose names are recorded in the story. So how did you find this as a chapter heading? Well, that was a chapter that it's about the uh, Victor's best friend, Henry Clerval. And that is his character. He's he's kind of like the the yin to Victor's yang, if you will. That sounds very simplistic, but he's this sensitive, artistic um, guy who he uh, loves like knights and and he reads King Arthur and stuff. So he's like very idealistic, as well as just somebody who you know. There's Victor who's involved with science and this and that, and then there's Henry who's involved with the ideas of the world and is very sensitive and noble and idealistic. So I really like how that quote introduced him and put him in contrast to others in the, in the book. Well, it was just such a great idea to keep threading just little blurbs of it. So we knew it was Frankenstein, but it was still your story and your take on it. Well, sometimes they were taking out of Shelley's context, but then put to other characters. So that was a little fun, little Easter eggs for those of you who are very familiar with Frankenstein. Yes. <laughs> so, and Lydia, you also used uh, some material from Dracula as your chapter headings. Did you think you were going to do that as you were writing the book? Yeah, I, I knew, well, I, I knew that I was going to do it because I had been like reading and rereading Dracula and um, annotating and like reading annotations and that sort of thing. And just, it's, the book is just flush with amazing quotes and spooky quotes. And they are just, Perfect. And so I just had all these quotes that I was like, I'm going to use these. And it was, it was so much fun because I would, re I would write a chapter and I would sort of like go with like sort of the feeling of the chapter or what Tilly was going through. And voila, I would like match it up with a, the perfect quote that was oftentimes paralleling what 
the characters in Dracula were going through as they were tracking down this monster and trying to figure out what was going on. Um, so it, it worked out just so well for me. And I like the idea of being able to um, put these little bits of the book in because Tilly's reading it for the first time just like you're reading my book, you know, hopefully, you know, for the first time. And so it was, it was just such a wonderful sort of refreshing thing to like put on the page, what was going through her brain, what she was seeing, um, as opposed to a quote from a book that has nothing to do with what, you know, the actual chapter's about. So it was, it was uh, a lot of fun to make those matches happen. I like the fact too, that you use some of the more well-known quotes, like listen to them, the children of night, what music that make. And then you also throw in things like, May I cut off the head of Miss Lucy? <laughs> <He's> like, <"What?" laughs> so that was a really. <laughs> I would. I absolutely recommend. It is a very readable book, and Halloween is coming up. Just you know, pick it up. I think it's free now. You know, it's it's um, so it's it's a fantastic reread. Absolutely. And Lisa, I wanted to talk to you about your quotes because you didn't use Dracula per se. You used all these great philosophers like uh, Augustine of Hippo. I mean, I thought this quote that you used, I'm just going to read just one of them. Uh, Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are, courage to see that they do not remain as they are. So, wow, where did, how did you decide to use these quotes and where did you find them? How did you thread them through? Well, Vlad himself was the absolute inspiration. When I was looking at his life, I was amazed to find out that not only did he live in a very cosmopolitan world when he was growing up in Hungary, but also he not only spoke his mother's Hungarian and his native Romanian, he also learned Italian, Greek, a bit of Turkish. He was a very well-rounded man. And I kept thinking to myself, well, someone like that is going to be exposed to literature. He would have had tutors growing and stuff, but he would have been exposed to literature as well. And when I kept looking at all of these quotes, I kept saying to myself, not only did I want them to tie into the particular theme of that runs through each chapter, but I was also thinking of them as these are probably things that Vlad himself would have read and come to understand as integral parts of his life. One of my favorite quotes from the book is, is by a, a philosopher who says, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. That I think absolutely identifies who Vlad is at that moment where he goes off planning to claim the bride that he will eventually marry because he has grown and he is very much a changed man from just the sword swinging, slashing knight that he was to a person who begins to understand not only the role that he can play in his country's future, but the role that he can have as a husband and now a potential father. So I, I thought it, I thought quotes that were excellent to sprinkle into each chapter to identify where he was in his life, but also to reflect his understanding of his work. Lovely, lovely, thank you. So I'm gonna wrap this up just a little with one last question. Um, Chris, so much of when you're talking about bad parenting in your version of Unnatural Creatures has to do with mothers not being there, sort of like in Shakespeare, there's you know the big mother issue happening in that. But as did, well as Disney. As well as Disney, that's right. That's where drama <laughs> yeah, is. So, yeah. so did you, when you first read Frankenstein, did it occur to you that there was a parenting issue or was it the monster issue that? It was the monster issue. And I was actually much more sympathetic to Victor because, you know, I was 12 years old and it's written, you know, it, Frankenstein begins, it's this epistolary uh, framework of Robert Walton, who is a Arctic explorer and he's off trying to find his way to the North Pole. And he says, you know, if only I had a friend, how lonely I am. And then he finds this man on the ice who is Victor Frankenstein. And he kind of has like a male, like a bro 
crush on him a little bit. He's like, my friend, he's so, you could tell by his accent, <laughs> he's so refined, he's so this, he's so that. And as a 12 year old, you know, you kind of like just buy that you don't have the, the critical facilities to kind of see mm -hmm. like, well, you know, he's doing all this stuff, which maybe isn't very cool. So, so yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how that shifted. It's only later, I think, especially after I became a mother and rereading Frankenstein that I saw, oh my God, I would never, ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have this little like, creature who's totally dependent on you and then you read Frankenstein, you're like, that's horrific. <laughs> <laughs> and Lydia, I wanted to ask you, I mean, there seemed to be a mother issue in your storyline too, in terms of nurturing and really being there. Was, did, were you aware that that was going to be a part of what your storyline too was? Um, I think not immediately. I, it kind of developed once I realized as I was sort of developing the plot and the outline before I write. I'm, a, I'm really big into plotting everything before I actually put words down. And so I, uh, I found it fascinating to talk about the sort of generational trauma that was going on in Tilly's family and how she's trying very much to break it. Of course, they didn't have words for these types of things. Um, but, you know, uh, the 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 way that women are very much um, uh, unable to do so many things, the way that their freedoms are oppressed, you know, it, it doesn't come just from the patriarchy. There are women involved in that as well, coming from above. And I wanted to, to look into that to see like, why, why is it okay for a grandmother to act like this? Why is it okay for a mother to act like this? Do they not see what's going on? And obviously culturally, it's difficult because you're in it. Um, and so I, I, I thought it was interesting to, um, to sort of tackle that because it's, um, you know, Tilly doesn't live in a vacuum, it's her family. And there are no, there is no patriarch in, in her family. There are no men in her family that are dictating that these things are happening. It's just her grandmother, her mother and herself. So I thought that was fun to explore. So Lisa, I'm gonna ask one last question of you. Um, this next generation of lads, do you think that this would have happened with this, with the wives that they have found? Or do you think it was a hereditary given that no matter what, these killing machines would have happened with these wives or not? Ah, uh, the nature versus nurture question. <laughs> I honestly, honestly, having examined all of their lives now, because um, although I have not written them, I have sketched all the lives of Vlad, the father, and uh, his three sons, not counting um, Vlad Dracula, because I promised Chris Humphreys that after I read his brilliant book, there is absolutely no way I could touch Vlad Dracula. I just couldn't do it. He had written the Bible on him, and that was it. But for the three sons, I, I have to say that I think very much that who they all become is it's it's really part of it's part of their nature but also it is very much the time in which they live i don't think that their encounters with the turks could have been otherwise avoided so i think they became exactly the men that they were supposed to become because of the times in which they were raised and also the way in which vlad's father mercia raised him and the way in which he raised each of his sons. I think they, they all understood they were living in an extraordinarily violent time. So there was nothing to do except to, if you wanted to protect your family and you wanted to live, you were going to defend yourself against that violence, whatever those means were. Yeah. Yeah, you, you certainly set up the political, I mean, it's such a complex situation happening in Europe and I was actually able to follow it because I always get so confused at that time, but you really mapped it out so brilliantly. So uh, kudos to that, my dear. So I'm going to quickly Thank just so much. Sc scroll up here and I'm going to copy the links where you can buy these fantastic books. And then I'm going to bring Faith up to say, uh, uh, I'm going to copy this in a minute after Faith talks to you. <laughs> so Faith, why don't you come up here? We'll, we'll just get out with this for a second. Okay, yeah, there I am. I think I'm centered, right? All right. Uh, yeah, so I just want to thank 
everyone uh, for showing up tonight, both here and virtually again, and um, working with us, you know, through our experiment. I noticed at least one comment saying that they, the person felt that it was worked you know, beautifully, but we're open to uh, feedback, you know, across the board. So if you want to see more of this, if you want to see less of it, if you want us to do something different technically, that'd be fine. And speaking of technical support, Robert, you want to stand up? We want to give you a hand. And Susan, I want to thank you again for really doing a marvelous job on moderating this panel. Obviously you did a lot, a lot of hard work in thinking about this and I thought you handled it beautifully. And finally to our panelists, again, absolutely brilliant ladies. You know, you did a lovely job. Uh, it was fascinating. I was riveted and I hope our uh, participants feel the same way. So big hand for our panelists. So folks, stay tuned. Uh, like I said, we're going to have a really fun uh, program next month. Uh, you know, we have our, our two people right here. Uh, so folks who are here, you, you know, if you want to grab and talk to them a little bit about it before we have to leave, feel free. Um, cause that, this is going to be something very different than anything we've done before. We've never had a real action packed, you know, uh, program. So looking forward to that. Uh, and then in December, uh, we're doing world war two. So, you know, watch for further information on that. And we do have programs that we're finalizing now for, uh, at the beginning of the year. Now in the beginning of the year, we're more than likely going to be zoom only. Um, but we'll see. How, how we're doing it. But you know, we, we've found that uh, when the weather gets bad, people tend to stay home. So in fact, we were having thunderstorms here and I'm very happy that all of you made it because I really expected like, you know, once the, once the thunderstorms rolled through that, you know, it'd be the steering committee. <laughs> yeah, so again, thank you all for coming and uh, we'll see you next month. All right. Thank you, bye. All right, signing off.